Welcome to Beyond Words Presents. Today I am here with Bella DePaolo. She is the author of our upcoming book, How We Live Now. It's right here. It's brand new, Redefining Home and Family in the 21st Century. It's beautiful. Welcome to the show, Bella. Thank you. And so everyone else knows, um, she is also the author of another book called Singled Out. She actually started her career, started you know, into this world, exploring the world of singles. And so that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. And we're also going to talk about how we are actually living as a society now. Um, and if you have questions, um, please be sure you can use the Google Hangouts app, or you can also use the hashtag BWPresents. And be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. So, Bella, the first question I have, and it's kind of an obvious one, but you did start your career. You did start researching life as a single person. What had you branch out into these different realms, into the whole world of how we all live? Yes, that seemed to be a question or an issue that came up a lot among single people. So. After I wrote Singled Out, I started blogging on Psychology Today and Psych Central and sometimes at the Huffington Post. And in the comments sections, people would often start talking about how do they figure out how to live, both what kind of place to live in and whether to live by themselves or with other people and where to live. And then I wrote this blog post called not going nuclear, so many ways to live and love. And it was about the fact that nuclear families are now very much in the minority. So most people, the vast majority of people, do not live in a nuclear family. And of course, if you're single and have no spouse, or if you're single or coupled and you have no kids, then you obviously don't have those components that were traditionally thought of as family. So living in a nuclear family uh, household is not even an option. So what do you do? And of course, many people live alone, but there are so many other possibilities as well. And I found that people really like to talk about that and share their experiences and their fantasies and their wishes for how to live. And so that was part of what got me going. And then also mm -hmm. noticing in the media, there were so many stories of people's innovative ways of creating a household, a family, a life. And so that also said to me that this was a topic that really captured people's um, interests at the moment. Well, and I, when you first mentioned, as you were talking about all of the, the different ways that you can live, I, I was thinking back to when I was a single person and I felt like a crushing pressure from society to get married, to live right. with my husband, to have kids, uh -huh. like uh -huh. step by step by step by step. And of course, now that I'm married, I feel the crushing pressure to have children. Right. And so just in reading parts of your book, it's it's there's a freedom in it that we are allowed, allowed, allowed to live whatever way we want. And I'm just curious, yeah. as you were interviewing people, what's the most yeah. interesting living situation you encountered? <laughs> well, the thing is, what's interesting depends on the person. So some people just love living under the same roof with everyone else and, um, and sharing a place. And you know, that used to be something that just young people do, but now you see more and more people doing it across the spectrum. And that includes probably the most famous version, which is the Golden Girls version, where you have older people who are retired and um, they decide to live together in one big household. So that's one possibility. Another really intriguing thing I discovered is called co-housing. And in co-housing, people come together who really want to be part of a genuine neighborhood, not just live next to each other, but really share their lives together. And so these communities have houses usually built around some center green space. And every house is like any other house you'd find anywhere else in terms of who's living in it. But what's different is that 
they also share what's called a common house. So everyone has their own house, and then there's one house that they all own in common. And they go there to share meals several times, they have meetings there, and the common house often has a guest room or several guest rooms or rooms to accommodate whatever the special interests are of the people in that neighborhood. And that might include playrooms if there's kids, music rooms, meeting rooms, anything that's of interest. And they are self-governing. They take care of the grounds themselves. They make all the decisions themselves. And so it really is a genuine community. And I think this sort of idea of having your own home within a real, almost old-fashioned village is, in a sense, very contemporary because you have the village aspects in the sense that you can walk out your front door and find people all around you or go to the common house and find people there. But at the same time, you do have your own house. So you have privacy and independence as well as the interdependence of a community which is right there with you. And that's what I found was one of the main themes of almost everyone I talk to. Everybody is looking for just the right mix of time alone, independence, privacy, and time with other people, connection, interdependence, doing things together, feeling like part of a neighborhood or a community. And what differs is the ratio different people want. So people who want the most togetherness might live with other friends or family or multi-generational family all under the same roof. People who want the most independence and privacy have places of their own, maybe not within a co-housing community, but really on their own. But still they might have that um, net social network that they can get to by meeting other people in person or getting on their computer on Facebook and social media and all the other email, all the ways that we can all connect with other people. Well, something that you said earlier um, just sparked a, a question in my mind and I can't let it go. Um, you said that we used to live in villages and now we're getting back to kind of that way of living. And I'm curious if you, in your research, found what had us move away from that and then also what had us move back toward it. Yeah. I, after World War II, there was a great movement towards suburbs and privacy and having your own nuclear family home. And it got to such an extreme that families no longer wanted to have their own parents, grandparents in the home with them. So then they started putting them in institutions. And so it got to this, this kind of extreme level of isolation where you have suburbs of detached single family homes and they ended up very isolated and it wasn't just their fine their feelings. Research showed that people became more and more uh, isolated from their neighbors, less likely to talk to them than they used to be before. And so what seemed like early on this dream of having your own place and a big house and a big yard and, and privacy became very inconvenient because now you don't you know, you have to drive to anywhere you want to go, and it's a lot to take care of, and you're not as connected to your neighbors as before. So then people got more interested in other kinds of living. And then as the demographics changed, as more people um, waited longer and longer to get married, more people didn't get married at all, more people had smaller families and no kids at all, then you got to the point where you can't, have that as your way of living. You can't have a nuclear family household if you don't have a spouse or you don't have kids. So then, how do you live? And it could seem like, oh no, what do I do now? But instead, the approach I took in my book, How We Live Now, was 
wow, look at all these opportunities. Look at what people are doing with this newfound freedom to create a way of living that works for them rather than just following a path. Mm -hmm. So in addition to you know, sharing a house with a multi-generational family or sharing a house with friends or living in co-housing or living by yourself, there are all sorts of other variations too. So for example, single mothers and their kids now have this option called co-abode and it's this registry where you can sign up and look for other single mothers and their kids who might want to share a home. And now there are 70,000 single parent families on co-abode who are looking not just to share a house because it would be less expensive, though that helps, but they're also looking to share a life because if they find a home together, then their kids have each other as playmates, they have each other as confidants, and they have help in doing the errands and watching the kids while one goes out. And it turns out to be just a wonderful and innovative uh, possibility for them. Well, and it's interesting what you say because I, I think of the joke where, you know, some kid graduates from college, gets a degree and a job that is just will not actually make them money so they go home and they live with their parents. Yeah. And so there's this negative connotation around the multi-generational living or there's a, a financial component to it that to me has always been the deciding factor. Yeah. And so it seems like that's changing though. It is. In fact, moments before we went on the air today, I got and noticed that there's a new Pew report out, a new survey which shows that even though um, millennials are getting more jobs, there's more jobs available, they're more employed now than they were a few years ago, they are still living with their parents at the same or higher rate than they were before. And so that takes the usual idea, oh, they're just doing it to save money, which obviously some of them are. Mm -hmm. But to take that as the only explanation turns out to be wrong. There are many reasons and what I loved about researching this part about young adults either coming back to live with their parents or never leaving is that what I found was very different from all the stereotypes. You know, they get stigmatized as the stuck generation, the go nowhere generation, and then their parents are called the helicopter parents, and there's all of this making fun of them in late night. But in fact, there's something very important about young adults and their relationship with their parents, which is very different from their parents relationship with their own parents a generation or two before. And what's different is young adults, for the most part, actually like their parents <laughs> and their parents <laughs> like them back. And so if you ask parents how they feel about their kids being home, most of them, you know, not all of them, but most of them actually like it. You know, they do things together. It's not like the generation of the 60s and 70s where people were, you know, their parents were looking at their kids with their long hair and their weird views and their hippie communities and their bell-bottom hands and saying, what happened? <laughs> where they really didn't get it. I mean, the parents and the kids were just miles apart. And now they're mostly on the same page. It's, I'm, I'm just fascinated listening to you because I have experienced that exact thing. Like I lived at home with my parents after I graduated from, from uh -huh. college. Yeah. And I love my parents. I think my parents are awesome. And so yeah. I'll go and I'll hang out with them on the weekend. Mm -hmm. and my husband is very much, I mean, we're both millennials. And so it's uh -huh. interesting to see that even in our generation, it's still evolving. Yeah. It's, He's like, she's my mom. I mean, I love her, but she's my yeah. mom. I'm not going to go hang out with her. Uh, so uh -huh. it's, it's, it's fascinating to hear what you found. Yeah. 
Yes, and they're very much in touch with each other. Um, the young, the young adults and their parents are in touch with each other very much and exchange a lot of advice and help. And the sociologists who have studied this and the psychologists have found that it's not just about the new availability, relatively new availability of cell phones, but that this increase in staying in touch with parents and parents with their kids started even before cell phones became so pervasive. Hmm. Interesting. Well, and it speaks to one of the main points that you make in your book is that the most important relationship that is there, I mean, you know, we yeah. have parental relationships, spousal relationships, right. kid relationships, but mm -hmm. it's the most important one is friendship. Yes. So in the 21st century, I think friendship is the most important relationship. It's obviously very underrated and unacknowledged, but it carries us through our lives, especially now that people uh, are, oh, here's one of my favorite statistics. People now spend more years of their adult life not married than married. Which is amazing, because usually we think single people are just marking time, waiting to get married. But really, that's how we spend the majority of our adult life. So that's part of it. But another part of it is that the characteristics of friendship, the values of friendship, map onto what our society is like these days. So for example, friendship is about choice. We get to choose our friends as long as they choose us back. Friendship is about individuality. We get to pick the people as our friends who express who we really are. And they, we can have different friends that map onto different sides of ourselves. And very importantly, friendship is also ideally an equal relationship. And that's really important too. And the way friendship norms actually become part of other relationships too is also part of what's going on in the 21st century. So for example, even in marriages, in contemporary marriages, many couples want to see themselves as more equal, as splitting things more equally and not as, okay, you do the guy things, I'll do the, do the woman thing, you know, and I'll do all the daycare because I'm the woman, you know. If they want to know, they want it more even, the decision making more even. And you see the same thing in multi-generational families. Once the kids grow up, they have more of an equal relationship with their parents and grandparents. They're more like friends and less like a hierarchy of I'm the authority and you know you're the kid. Now there might still be some of that, but it's inching toward equality and friendship. And even in um, something like co-housing or the other kinds of innovative, um, the co-abode that people come up with, those ways of living too, I like to call them life spaces, they also work best on an equality model where we're all in this together and nobody's better than anyone else and we're all going to help out to keep the space up and to decide what to do and that's a real that's a real new thing that's a brilliant way to look at it. It's fascinating. And I just want to take a moment and, and show your beautiful book again. It's not out yet. It's actually not out. Please do. It's actually not out until the end of next month. Um, but you can actually purchase it because of the show today. We're putting together a bundle of Bella's old book, Singled Out. Um, the hardcover version, which is actually not available anymore, as well as How We Live Now and a discussion guide about How We Live Now all together for a 30% discount, so it's $36.40, and you can get that at beyondword.com forward slash Bella, B-E-L-L-A. Great. And so, Bella, one question that I had for you, it just it's kind of a personal question even, yeah. is that how do you know if your living situation is your ideal living situation, or nice. how do you explore other living situations? Sure. Um, 
I love, you know, when I talk to people about their living situations, I ask them all sorts of questions. I talk to each person for a long time. And when I ask them questions like, when you go away, how do you feel when you come back? They say, I love it. How long do you think you'll stay here? And I'll say, they'll carry me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and so some people really do feel that. They have found or created just the right life space. They found their place, their space, and their people. Now, some people really do want to find like the right situation, whether it's living with other people or living in a community or living by themselves. And that's what they are looking for. Now, other people, like one person I interviewed called herself a variety junkie. So she finds a way of living. She really likes it for a while. And then she says, OK, that's enough. Now I want to try something else. So there are people who just love to explore different life possibilities. And I think a lot of people, especially when they're younger, aren't quite sure yet. So they're trying out things. They're trying living with friends. They're trying living on their own. Maybe they're trying living with family. And it also may change. So over the course of your life, maybe what feels right for you at one point is going to be different at another. When I was um, researching Singled Out, what really intrigued me were some people who had been married had great marriages, so now they're widowed, and they say, I had a wonderful marriage, I loved my husband, and I will never marry again, <laughs> because I had a good experience, but now I really like being single, and that's it for me. And what was interesting about that is that they weren't running away from marriage as something that was terrible for them. It was wonderful, but now they wanted a different kind of wonderful. Mm. And that was really fascinating, too. You know, and another thing, speaking of marriage, another really interesting thing I found was couples who are totally committed to each other, love each other, have not, are not at all uncertain about whether they want to stay together, but they don't want to live together. And so they each have houses of their own. And it's not because, you know, one of them has a job far away or is pursuing education far away or any of the external reasons. They choose it. They choose a committed relationship, but they also choose a place of their own. Yeah, I read that in your book and it just did not compute in my brain. <laughs> well, yeah, and you know... I love that because what the real bottom line of this book is, you don't have to relate to what everybody else is doing. All you need to do is find or create the one way of living that really works for you. And what was interesting about doing the research for this book and talking to all these people is that so many of them created things out of their own life experiences. So the person who created Co-Abode, Carmel Sullivan, she had been, she had just gotten divorced, and she was feeling devastated and lonely and alone, and she moved to the LA area. She had friends there, she had family there, and she was living on her own, but it just wasn't enough. And at one point, it just occurred to her, I want to live with another mother raising her kids as a single mother. And so she put out this notice. This was before the days of where everything was on the Internet. She put out this notice saying, um, anyone in the local area, would you like to, to share a house with me and we'll create a nice environment for our kids? And 18 people answered, and this was just a small area. And then she realized, well, if 18 people are interested in this small area, how many people will be interested in all of LA, in all of California, in all of the United States? And years later, she created this online registry with 70,000 people. So it's 
you know, to her, she would look at people who live alone or people who live with friends or all these different possibilities, and she might not relate to that. So she tried to think about what would work for her and found, well, this great solution, which, you know, some other people would look at and say, no way would I ever merge households with another family I don't even know. <laughs> and yet, it works for her and it works for so many other people. And by the time they actually join households, they do know each other well. That's another really important aspect of what people are doing differently when they decide or figure out how to live now. They do it very mindfully. So at the Co-Abode website, you can find questionnaires and resources of all these different things you should think about and talk about with the other single parent family and meet and discuss. And so when those two families get together and decide to share a place together, they already know so much more about each other than <laughs> conventional groups sometimes do. Even you know, dating couples often do not talk about the wide range of possibilities that these single moms do before they get together. See, it's making me think I need to go on that website and find that questionnaire. <laughs> you may. And with my husband and go through yes, it. Yes, I think you should think about it. <laughs> you know, and the other, um, the other iteration of that, which is even more radical, are single people who really, really want to have kids, but they don't want to raise them as single parents. And they feel like they're getting close to that age where they better have kids now. <laughs> and it's not just women who feel that way. You know, there are men who think, I don't want to wait till I'm 50 to have kids. And so they get to this age and they decide, I want kids. I don't want to settle for someone to marry just because I want kids. Mm -hmm. But I want to find someone else who is just as devoted as I am to raising kids and seeing them through their lives. And so I'm going to look for someone, not as a marriage partner, but as a parenting partner. And now there are all sorts of websites for people who want to parent together without necessarily being married or in any kind of romantic relationship. So that was something that was totally new to me. I had no idea that was happening before I started this project. See, that's another one that messes with my brain. Because I feel like when you're in such an intimate relationship as raising a child, because the stuff you have to talk about, the ideals you have to share in order to be able to do that, it feels like a relationship would naturally grow out of that. <laughs> and sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. But, um, you know, I confessed in the book that when I first learned about this, I thought, oh, isn't this going to be... Hard. You know, what happens if they get in a relationship outside of their couple? You know, does one get envious? Does it wreak havoc on the whole thing? And then I realized, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm being small-minded about this. Because in ordinary marriages, you know, people have been known to stray. <laughs> and the difference is they do it sneakily. <laughs> Whereas in these parenting partnerships, it's all out in the open. Mm. And the parenting partnerships, too, are very mindful. So just like at Co-Abode, there are all these questionnaires and lists of resources and topics to discuss before you decide to do this. And the encouragement to spend lots of time together before you really commit to doing this. And they typically do. So again, they get to know each other and explore more different areas of you know what their philosophy of parenting is, what they think of discipline, what their religious views are, what their political views are, what they think of you know so many aspects of life so that they're ready. Yeah. Well and what I'm hearing in everything that you're saying and all of the different aspects of living that you're talking about is that there's a very strong element of choice. Yes. It's not just that this is the path that has been determined for me. It's the, mm -hmm. 
what do I want? Like yes. what really works for me and then choosing that. Yes. And you I think by reading the book and what people have been telling me is they're just so heartened by the array of choices out there. And the other thing is that once you start thinking about it, you realize you can create a version that works for you that maybe no one has ever thought of before. And that's really exciting too. So it is about choices and possibilities and not being limited by the one script you described at the very beginning, you know, that all oh, this pressure to get married, which I call matrimania. And then when you get married, the pressure is still not off. When are you going to have kids? Yes. <laughs> and what this book is saying is you can choose what's right for you. If you want to get married, then have kids and stay married and do the conventional thing, that's totally fine. If you want to live in multi generational households that we think of as old fashioned, that's had making a comeback too in a really sweet way. Mm -hmm. Or you can do something totally radical like get together with someone else to parent a kid through their life without being a couple yourself. And so there are just so many possibilities and um, it's I think it's exciting. So of all those possibilities that you were seeing, is is there one that's the most popular or that you're seeing growing faster than the others? Oh, you know, there is a really simple answer to that. Every way of living is becoming more and more popular, except two of them. One, nuclear family living, that's going down. And the other is the old style communes where people shared everything, sometimes even clothes. No. <laughs> people aren't too into that these days. So, but everything else. Living with multiple generations, that's becoming more popular. Living on your own is becoming more popular. These co-housing communities are are growing. People who, the couples who are committed to each other but want places of their own, that seems to be growing, although though we don't have great statistics on that yet. So I think every iteration except nuclear families and communes well, one of the questions that I have for you is why do you feel right now that it's so important to talk about how we are living now? But I feel the answer in it. I feel the answer to that in the answer that you just gave. It's just that we need to be, not need to be, but there's a freedom in being aware of all of these different ways of living so that we don't because I step outside my front door and I see across the street a nuclear family, I see down the street a nuclear family, I see them all over the place. But what I'm hearing you say is that in fact, instead of the nuclear family being the norm, the norm really is everything but. Yes, it is. Um, so. I think I lost you there a little bit. I did. In the middle. I think it cut out a little bit. But I, think I, know what your, yeah. I think I know what your question is. <laughs> so the reason there's we need to talk about it today, and there's so many, so many uh, ways of thinking about it now, is because of the demographic changes. Because so many people are staying single for so long, or even after they were married, you know, because women still outlive men. There are women who were married and yet have years or sometimes decades on their own afterwards if they are widowed or divorced. Um, there's so many more people who aren't having kids or having smaller families. And so even if they had siblings, those siblings might not be on the same coast. <laughs> they might not be in, in the same area or they might be preoccupied with, with their own lives. And so in a way, we need to innovate now because we have no choice <laughs> because we can't default to the usual way of living in a nuclear family if we don't have a spouse, if we don't have kids, or if we have family but they're not around or they're preoccupied with other things. So that's part of it. And the other part of it is that choice and expressing our own individuality is where the 21st century is and where we're headed. So we have choices in everything about our lives. When you think of, you know, 
the old style idea of all the kids and mom and dad gather around the TV and watch Lassie together. <laughs> you know, no. Everybody has their own programs and if they can afford it they have their own rooms and their own phones and their and sometimes even at dinner time, you know, they have their own what to eat. You even see these fast food places or these these delivery places saying, oh, you can each choose what you want. So even if you get takeout, you can get all different versions of takeout. So people are used to, even kids are used to zeroing in on who they are as individuals and making choices. And so, of course, when they get to adulthood, you know, they're not going to want someone saying, this is how you have to live. They're going to think about, well, what do I want? Do I want to live with people? Do I want to live by myself? Regardless of who I want under my roof, do I want to have people around me who are going to be a real neighbors or who are going to be a village? Or do I not want any of that either? I want my privacy. And they can choose that or they can choose some new variation of, um, you know, I've met people who were really good friends or got to be good friends with someone and they purposefully moved somewhere where they could be in the same neighborhood or they could be part of a duplex or you know so they could have their choosing their place their space and their people they're creating their own life space in a way that really would not have been something people would have thought about in the 1950s or 60s. You know, it just, it just didn't happen. Nuclear family was, at least for certain segments of society, just so dominant that mm -hmm. that's, that was just the default, and now it's not. Oh, God, you say that, and I still feel like it so strongly is, because even when you just mentioned dinner, just hear about people, everybody sitting down to have dinner together. Right. There's the whole movement about everybody returning to the dinner table because that's what helps mm -hmm. keep the family strong and lots of the 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 movement around that. And at the same time, it's like what you're talking about really is it's building up that family connection or that friend connection, as yeah. you say, is the most important, mm -hmm. but still respecting that family all at the same time. So it, I don't know. It's just yes, it's interesting. That's right. So. Um, one of the things that holds co-hosts and communities together is the fact that they do have dinner together or lunch together several times a week. And yet, mm -hmm. they all have each co-housing house has their own kitchen. So again, it's that interplay of privacy, independence, time to yourself, and connection, being part of a community, part of a neighborhood, and interdependence. There's a, a mindset, I think, that, and, and please, because you've done so much more research on this than I have, <laughs> yeah. but I have my own experience and the people I know, but it seems like there's a mentality in my generation and the millennials of trying to be self-sufficient, of trying to be singular, of trying to do everything by themselves. <laughs> and kind of what I'm hearing you saying is that we're also now discovering that that actually doesn't work. <laughs> that we're having to set that aside and, you know, deal with how we set that aside, and then reconnecting with people? Well, I think that some people really do like that self-sufficiency, and they like doing as much as possible on their own, and that's fine. And then there are people who really want more of the connection. So it does work for some people, to some extent, and for other people it doesn't. So that's really where I come down in this book is that different strokes for different folks that what works for um, you know for some people might not for others so um, I read this article when I was doing research on the book that said living alone is so overrated and I don't think any one thing not even nuclear family is overrated because it's what works for you there are still many people for whom that nuclear family, detached house in the suburbs is it. And that's fine. And really, that's what I'm trying to say in the book is 
find what's fine for you, what really works for you, and don't worry about if other people think you're a kook or you know you're doing the wrong thing or you know you should be doing what's right for you because in this time that we live in, you have more opportunities to live your most authentic life than people have ever had before. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that's really holding you back is if you are worried about what other people think or if you just can't think of something imaginative. But I hope reading the book will help you see the many amazing possibilities they are, there are and then maybe come up with some of your own. Well, and I just, I, I read through your chapter on friendships and how people are creating friendships as their yeah. family and the the story of the woman, I believe her name is Marianne, and yeah. how she, she went from, you know, kind of on that path of she'd gotten married, they'd bought a really big house, yes. and then her cat peed in her closet, and she said, yeah. this isn't right for me. Right, right, her cat to had a tower. This is a lousy way to live. Yeah. <laughs> Even though in a lot of people's way of thinking and in the narrative we often hear, she had it all. You know, she had this big house, and she had a husband, and she was in this great neighborhood. Great in some ways, but not to her. And it wasn't right for her. You know, she said she followed the script, get married, get a house, get a bigger house, get a bigger house, <laughs> and it wasn't right. And so she got divorced, and then she started exploring how she wanted to live, and she really did this very, um, very self-consciously. She went to uh, these small conferences and talked to people and read and explored and, and ended up being a real advocate of living in community. And for her, her community is she wants to live under the same roof with other friends. And that's what she does. But for other people, living in community might mean you have your own place, but you are among people who want to be neighborly, want to be friendly. Um, and so, yeah, so for her, it became friendship, which was the heart of what she was doing. Hmm. And I just was thinking, it's it's really interesting just talking with you because I, as I mentioned, it's like I just got married, my husband and I just bought a house, yeah. and I feel like I have all of these these expectations, like there yeah. are certain things you're supposed to do with your neighbors, like you're supposed to give every single one of them a gift when you first arrive as a, oh, really? thank I didn't you for welcoming me. Oh, trust me, it's like all in my oh, brain. I did the wrong thing, I just moved <laughs> A year ago, I never gave anyone a gift. Oh no! Exactly. It's just like I have these things in my head, and I I'm sure that other people have other things in their head about what it means to be neighborly. Yeah. And so I've been feeling like a really horrible neighbor because I haven't done all of those prescribed things. Uh huh. But just in talking to you, what I'm sensing is that it's like if I feel like creating a relationship there, like if that is something that's really fulfilling for me, then I create a relationship there. Yeah. If I choose to be, you know, with me and my husband in my house and enjoying yeah. our house and in the backyard and every once in a while we wave to our neighbors, yeah, that's that is also problem. okay. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't have to live somebody else's script. <laughs> you can create, write your own. Yeah, and it's just, it, it's it's very freeing, and so I, I, I will mention it again, and I'll show it again, because I know you, you enjoy you. this part, but <laughs> this is Bella's new book, How We Live Now. Again, it's out in uh, the end of next month, so yeah. we are doing this a little bit early, but you can get a pre-order of this book, so you'll be one of the first people to get it, as mm -hmm. well as a copy of her previous book, Singled Out, in hardcover, which is no longer available, so it's a great deal. You can get the, those two books, as well as a discussion guide to this book, um, all for a 30% discount, which is $36.40, and you can get that at beyondword.com forward slash Bella, B-E-L-L-A. <laughs> and Thanks. so I'm curious also, Bella, just because I'm a curious person, yeah. If was there one way of living that you were like, wow, I really wish I had discovered this as I was growing oh up, or as I was okay. learning about well, living for myself? Fashions I live by myself. I love living by myself. <laughs> and, and that's really the way I want to live. And so for me, the most 
heartening discovery is that there's this movement called the Village Movement that is dedicated to helping people stay in their own homes for as long as they want. So for me, um, you know, I'm totally fine now, you know, I'm healthy and all that, and I can do everything I need to do for myself, but what happens when that's not true anymore? And you can join this village group and make a phone call or send an email and they will help you with your computer problems or give you a ride somewhere or find a referral for what you need and there are social activities you can join in if you want to do that. And so that was great for me. Now, I also found lots of these other permutations fascinating. So I found co-housing really fascinating. I went to six different co-housing communities around the country because I just found it so amazing. But I don't think, I don't know, I just really like living by myself. So that's, that's what I like. But well, and I, I, I read in the introduction of your book, you also mentioned the fact that lots of other publications are talking about yeah. how you're living now, and they're, I mean, they're talking about co-housing. There was actually an article in this this month's or last month's Portland Monthly about right. a co-housing community yeah. in Portland, and I saw that, and I was like, wow, it really is everywhere. Yeah. It was so wonderful. wonderful. They had a, a conference in Durham, North Carolina, I think in May, and it was totally sold out. So I think people are really interested in that, which is really nice to see. Absolutely. Well, and I, I love your message of you know find the friendship. Right after my husband and I got married, it was actually my husband and I and my best friend. The three of us all lived in a house together. Oh, I love it. See, those are the kinds of things I was looking for and finding <laughs> when I wrote the book. And I think yeah. that's great because. You know, it's sort of an openness. It's not like you're looking at your husband and he's looking at you and saying, we're the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you realize that, you know, you have this commitment to your friend and you like being with your friend. And that's, that's lovely. Yeah, and it was exactly that. And I think a lot of people saw what we were doing and were very confused. They were like, <laughs> "That's you right. just got married and you're going uh -huh. to live with this other uh -huh. person? Right, yeah. And so many of the different ways of living, the people doing it are getting that, you know, especially the couples who live apart, you know, like, oh, there's something going on, you're cheating on each other. No, we just like our own space. That's awesome. Well, yeah. and I love, you also talk about the pets that get integrated into all of this, and it's, it, it, it's just very interesting because living is something, and I know this sounds, it sounds weird when I say it, but living is something that we don't give a lot of thought to. Right. I don't think. Yeah. We just go along that path. Uh -huh. It's just uh -huh. what you're supposed to do. Buy your uh -huh. house, live in your house, get married. Yeah. 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 And, you know, what's interesting, too, is that as people start thinking about this and become more imaginative, you see the housing industry, the construct, um, construction industry, and the builders and the architects kind of noticing too, and it's really fun for them because instead of just building these detached single-family houses in the suburbs, they get to think about, you know, how do we create a place with two master suites instead of one and, and a separate entrance or a separate suite or, you know, how do we let people live together in ways that they are connected with each other in really rewarding ways, and yet they have their privacy too. And so there's a lot of innovation going on in that way too. Oh, that's fascinating. It just it makes me think too, in college, uh -huh. if you live in the dorms in college, that's how you yeah. live. Like you live yeah. in suites where there's a room, but there's a common uh -huh. room, or right. in a yeah. building where there's a hundred people on your floor and you hang out yeah. with them. Yeah. And then we get shoved out into the world, and they're like, live in one house. Yeah. <laughs> by yourself, with one other person. Right, right. And there's so many other possibilities. Yeah. And you know, that there's still time. I'd like to say something about multi-generational households. Okay. You know, we think of those as old-fashioned. But in fact, in the lifespans used to be so much shorter that in the year 2000, 
um, a 20 year old was more likely to have a living grandmother than a 20 year old in 1900 was to have a living mother. So in, in 1900 the lifespan was 47 years. So people couldn't live in multi-generational households because the different generations didn't overlap that much. And mm -hmm. now we have people like the four-generational household that I open one of my chapters with, which is just, you know, just so touching. And, you know, people can do that now, too, in a way that just wasn't possible in the past. Yeah, and it's that friendship that, that is so strong yes. between all of those generations oh, yeah. that really they just, that possible. They just love each other. It's just so, yeah. so touching. That's awesome. Well, we are coming up to the end of our time, and I just want to say, Bella, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation with okay. us because it really has its opened my mind. I hope it's everybody who's watching, I hope it's opened yours because there really are more ways to live than just, you know, husband, wife, two kids, and, you know, a nice green lawn, which, you know, none of us really have a green lawn this summer, so that right. one's already gone. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Whitney. <laughs> Well, and thank I, you, everyone who's listening. It's great. And feel free to get in touch with me if you have questions. And also, I'll just say it one more time for everybody who's watching. This is Bella's new book. Yes, it's not out until the end of August, but you can pre-order it, as well as a copy of her book, Singled Out, and a discussion guide for how we live now, all for $36.40 at www.beyondword.com forward slash Bella. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. <laughs> thank you.